so today I'm reviewing A Stitch in Time by Kelly Armstrong. And from a little sticker on the spine, you can see it's like a paranormal genre. And it's a hardcover copy, and the inside actually has these pretty cool illustrations. And the front cover is pretty much the same. There's no illustrations throughout, but yeah. And also the pages are a little bit glossier than usual. So this one, it did take me quite a while to get through it. I wasn't super motivated. Um, at the start of the day, I'd probably read about um, this much. And I just was sick of drawing it out, so I wanted to get it done today. So I could review it. Uh, what to say about this one? Um, the reason I was finding it hard to get through is I just didn't care. The initial few little pages I probably read over a week or more. You know, here and there with breakfast or dinner. And just it didn't grip me, it didn't make me want to come back and keep reading, which is why it was just so slow. And, you know, as I went through today, it did have points of interest. It was more interesting, more engaging than it had been at the start. But I was pretty much just single-mindedly determined to get it done, and that was really what was drawing me attention rather than the merits of the story itself. So in brief, the plot is a woman, 38-year-old uh, historian who lives in Canada, used to spend time at a family home in Scotland, which is this house featured on the front cover. And there's a special thing about the house where she can slip into a different time period, the Victorian era, where she has a friend called William who she's been slipping into his time since she was a child, spent time together, and they came back there, I don't know, every summer or so as she was growing up, so it formed a strong bond with him, she had to be careful that no one else saw her, but she fully shared with William that she was from the future, and they talked about that. When she was 15, there was a terrible accident where her uncle died, she hasn't been back to the house until now, after her aunt who owns the house has died, um, Bronwyn, um, who's the main character, she did get married at one point, but at the point of the story, her husband died eight years ago. Anyway, she comes back to the house because it's her inheritance now. She's going to be renovating it, and she slips back into to his time. You know, a big deal was made at the start of the fact that when the terrible accident happened at 15, she'd gone to a psychiatric ward and, you know, thought she was crazy and imagining the ghost she saw and what happened as a child, it was just, you know, all her imagination, so she's just gaslighting herself the whole time. So it takes some time for her to accept that it wasn't all in her head, and she really is slipping back in time, and she is seeing ghosts and yada yada. So the plot is partly her romance with this guy, William, in the Victorian era, and also this, um ghost plot, why the why these ghosts appearing to her and what are they trying to tell her and then later on when it's determined that they were murdered, she's sort of trying to figure out how they got murdered. So it's quite an interesting plot, like an interesting premise on the surface of it, but it just yeah wasn't super engaging the whole way through. Um I did write down some notes, I'll probably just go to them now. Okay, so page 10 was the first thing that annoyed me when she insulted the Yorkshire accent. Now the story is written in first person, so all the impressions we're getting is from the character, not necessarily the author. Let's 
still. Um, I'll just see if I can find that on page 10. Yeah, okay. Translating Dolores's North, North Yorkshire accent is taking all my brain energy right now. At least she isn't using these and vows as you sometimes find the folk was her age. Dad says when I was four I came back from our summer trip talking like an 80 year old North Yorkshire native and, all, and my junior kindergarten teacher figured I'd suffered a brain injury. My speech garbled beyond comprehension. The more Dolores talks though, the faster my internal translator works and soon my brain is making the appropriate substitutions and smoothing out her accent. I just found that offensive. Um, I have a strong appreciation for different dialects and accents and I find it really annoying um, stereotypes about certain accents being garbled and nonsensical and you know just because they're not standard British English or standard general American English doesn't mean that they're more difficult to understand inherently it's just a, something that you know you may not be used to if you don't have the dialect whatever it was annoying but it wasn't presented as like you know a prejudice or a um, failing of the character a flaw of the character um, she's portrayed to be quite progressive so it was just an annoying thing I guess it's trying to be funny I just don't find it funny Um, yeah, one of the ways that she tried to be progressive, the character that is Bronwyn, um, is accepting the trans character she came across, which, you know, I thought was pretty cool to see a trans character, the transness didn't really come up and it wasn't really a big character that featured a lot, but basically the person she was just referring to as Dolores it actually goes by Del, uses he, him pronouns, and is, um, as far as we know, a trans guy. And he's sort of like a retired caretaker of the house that takes her to the house and stuff when she first arrives. And actually Del's wife is more featured in the story as it goes on because I don't really remember her name, but she tells Bronwyn about ghosts and knows about that for some reason. So you know that was interesting to see a trans character there. Um, Page 89, subconsciously hoping, okay, see if I can find that. Yeah, that's the name of Del's uh, wife, Freya. Yeah, okay, here it is. So, I'm pretending I'm fine with how things ended with William while subconsciously hoping I'll see him again, which requires staying up all night. So again, the beginning's like her very much going back and forth about what she wants to do. But I just found it a little bit annoying in the first person um, perspective. Why are you saying subconsciously hoping? Either it's conscious and that's how you know that you're hoping for something or it's subconscious and you don't know that you're hoping for it. A nitpick, but it's just not funny. Um, something I found a lot and it really grated on me, especially at the beginning when I wasn't you know, intent on finishing it today, was a weird use of telling and recounting things as lo as things she's remembering rather than showing and showing how she's experiencing it and dramatizing it. For an example on page one sixteen to seventeen. Okay, no, it's earlier than that. I wrote down the numbers wrong. 
So yeah, this chapter starts after well, the last chapter she was hanging out with William, looking at horses, and this chapter, t chapter 12, starts with her having a bath and thinking about the day and then remembering about when she was 15 and um, thinking about how it was like a perfect relationship and how they had fights and all the stuff. I don't even know if I should read part of it, but um, okay, maybe this. I remember times when I'd storm off back to my world or he'd stalk off to his barn, days passing before we spoke again, and there'd been a strange sense of satisfaction and accomplishment in those arguments. We discovered more about one another and navigated the deep waters of our differences, successfully returning to hand-holding walks in the moors and sweet kisses in the barn. So yeah, she probably goes on for about three pages of just remembering, contemplating, and thinking about it. And it's just so, um, I found it a strange choice to be trying to convince us through narrative that they are such a great couple instead of showing us. We do get scenes later on, and maybe even before this, I can't remember exactly where this is in the, the chronology of the story, where you do see their interactions, and they're pretty good. But I just found it annoying, this sort of trying to convince the reader that it's, you know, a great relationship, we have fights, but then we're friends again, and, you know, we had differences in here, and this is how we worked it out, it's like, okay, but it doesn't make me care about the characters, it doesn't make me root for them, it's just annoying. There was a lot of that throughout the story, actually, of, um, of trying to show us how ideal of a partner William was, not really show us, but again, tell us how ideal he was, and I found it kind of weird that something that comes up as what makes them a really good match is just the differences in their time period and the social mores of the time. For example, William Ward always comments on what she's wearing, if she's wearing modern clothes, as being really skimpy for his standards at the time. But he's like kind of into it and he's like oh yeah i was born in the wrong century sort of thing and it's like okay maybe once it would have been funny to comment on how different the standards of dress are but it's almost like you know he likes her being the more sexually liberated person of our time because the women of his time would have been all you know that would be too scandalous for them so it's like a really big draw of her him is just that she's more sexually open. Not that's a problem, but it just seems like a coincidental thing because she just comes from our time. So anyone from our time would have had that um, benefit and would have been appealing to him. But it's like a cornerstone of why he likes her. And then for her, something that comes up a lot and came up several times where she made fun of her weight or how, how much food she ate and later on she did sort of critique herself for that which I appreciated but I kind of wish it wasn't there to begin with but like there was this scene where they were eating scones and she was like joking to him about how many scones she ate but he sort of didn't even know what she was talking about and thought she was mentioning crumbs on her and then she was like you know happy about it because he wasn't fat shaming her or complaining about how much she was eating and again I don't think that was meant to be a particular trait of his but just a commentary on the fact that the mores of the time are different and they wouldn't think of of diets in the same way as we do so again a big draw about him is just something that you should have got with anyone from his time uh, yeah, and then, you know, there's other things that they like about each other, but a lot of it, again, is in this narrative telling instead of showing why they like each other. Um, thinking about the scenes they do spend together, there's one where they're, like, having a picnic, she's dancing, oh my god. There was one night where 
people she came over and he had like a mini ball set up for just the two of them so they had people playing instruments and people dancing in the yard and then they had dinner together later but there was this scene which I found quite cringy because <laughs> she can bring stuff across to time as well like to his time like she's brought baskets of fruit and stuff to share with him and she's, she brings her phone across too so it's like oh look at this fun little phone and stuff but she has music on her phone so he wanted her to dance to him and she pulled out her phone and played Sia Move Your Body and like dance to it and I don't know why but the, the fact that it was Sia Move Your Body the fact that she named a particular song for some reason cringed me out I don't know <laughs> And I like the song, it's not like I think it's a bad song for some reason, just the thought of her going back to Victorian time, putting on like a modern pop song and dancing to it, it just, it cringed me out. It really did. Um, yeah, okay. So another part that annoyed me, page 133. Oh yeah, I found this part annoying. It was seen at some points that the reader had, you know, done all the research and wanted to get her facts in there. You know, because she went to the trouble of researching them. So she wanted to include them. And I'm kind of torn on it because the narrator character is a historian. So it's not exactly out of character that she would info dump things about the time period or make commentaries about the differences in the two time periods or lecture the reader about things it's technically may be in character and part of her voice but it's not like she uses her historian skills for any particular plot points so it's kind of a little bit convenient to me that the author made a her, her historian so she could um, have the excuse to do info dumps and maybe she had another reason for that you know maybe it was trying to show the fact that having slipped into this time period since she was a child that made her curious about history and want to be a historian we don't think she ever made that connection though because I think the characters the protagonist's father was also a historian so yeah it just rings to me a little bit convenient because you wanted to info dump all the research you'd done for the story. Okay, so there was this paragraph that annoyed me. They're talking about horses. And she was going to put his horse away in the stable. The question, of course, is whether the stallion will allow it. There's a reason most people stick to mares and geldings as riding mounts. A stallion is headstrong and difficult, accustomed to leading rather than following. All that is the common perception. The truth, as William would be quick to point out, is that while wild horses generally have one stallion for a group of mares, the male often serves more as a stud and guardian with a mare in charge. This doesn't mean a stallion is a docile creature, ready to be led by anyone. He requires a firm hand, a leader he trusts, as he would expect in a herd. Balios is very well trained though, and when William hands him over, with a few words and a pat, stallion dames to let me take him in why was that necessary it was for this one quick little action of she was going to put the horse in the stable and she just had to give a whole paragraph about how stallions are hard to work with but actually not but actually yes but this one's well trained so it wasn't and it was like i didn't get anything out of this this wasn't actually dramatizing something that was actually happening the horse wasn't misbehaving it was like a thought you had which you had a counter thought to and another counter thought to and it was just like why why are you including this and yeah sometimes she would just go on these little rants about things little lectures about things where i was just confused as to why this was happening and no i can relate to why you would want to be putting in a lot of the details that you went to the effort to research but you could have some restraint, I think, in showing details that are relevant to the character, relevant to the story. Maybe choose to make the horse misbehave. 
all choose to make the horse calm and make a quick comment about it we don't need a whole paragraph of theories about stallions it was just weird um okay and then there was on page 138 which was annoying me too okay so this is where they were going on their date yeah this whole page is talking about social progression and like how women can do different things in her time frame to his time frame which is yeah all narrated not dramatized like it's her telling what's the conversations have been now and in the past so i really want to read the whole thing but um okay he lives in a time when women don't attend university much less teach at one the first women's college had opened a few years ago but it was geared towards producing nurses Yet William is neither shocked nor even surprised that I hold a job unknown to women in his era. When we known each other at 15, our conversation taught him more than the technological advances to come. They gave him insight into the social advances and being a thorn, known for their progressive ideas. For William, women holding careers is hardly a sign of the apocalypse. In truth, a career like mine was nearly as much as an impossibility for a man in his position and its opportunity he'd have liked for himself. As a historian, I know that when we pride ourselves on our social advances, part of that arises from a misunderstanding of the past. Looking at England, going into the 19th century and then coming out of it, you see that it advanced at least as much as it did during the 20th century. And then she talks about how, you know, the guy that she married who died 80 years ago was African and how William didn't bat an eyelid at it and like colonialism and all this other stuff. It's not bad that she's included commentary on social issues don't get me wrong i think that's an interesting thing to explore with this sort of time travel situation but i just wish she'd sort of weaved it through in a more natural way instead of just dumping it just dumping it randomly also that they don't seem to have any friction over things he's just you know cool with it doesn't better I live than any of it he's just so perfect he 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 rises above the social mores and conventions of his time apparently doesn't cause any conflict so why is it relevant it's just seems like she just wanted to make commentary on it out of her own interest which was really or, or maybe to um preempt if the reader had any confusion about why he was reacting certain ways to things it's like she's preempted by saying like no they did have these conversations you know here's are the differences but he didn't even mind about that because he's from a progressive family so yeah again just to me in the logic of the story i don't know why the character speaking in first person narrating his story just decides to dump all this information in the middle of the picnic to the reader you know why aren't we seeing the conversations if they're so relevant why aren't we hearing the back and forth seeing the disagreements and getting something juicier out of that i don't know i don't know so that was all the notes that i took down um as i was reading today some of the things that also frustrated me was the sort of competing elements of the romance plot with the ghost slash murder mystery plot in that um when she was doing the romance things now having a bit of flirt going on and they were getting all like turned on and stuff i was like okay are we gonna have smut now and we got stuff leading up to that but then the actual sex scene was like two lines and i was like is that it why did we gloss over that why is this a romance book if it's not a romance book why are we spending so much time on the romance 
and even the little romance book do books not in romance not have sex scenes? Frustrating, very frustrating. They were like teasing it for like chapters and chapters. And when they had that thing with the dads, they were like flirting with each other so much. There were some really good descriptions leading up to it, and then disappointment. Only got like two sentences of their actual sex scene, so I was like, thanks for that. Um, and then the mystery stuff, I was like, okay, all this stuff going on with ghosts. I think about a third of the way through the story, I was like, maybe it's William that's the murderer. And as the story progressed on, and there seemed to be little bits of pieces which did point to William, I was like, okay, you know, really take this story up a rating, take it up a notch, is if she committed and she had the guts to make William the murderer. I was like, maybe that's why they're not drawing us into the sex scenes, because they don't want us to, you know, get too overly attached, or, you know, they want us to get overly attached, but they don't want to put the character through, you know, the heartbreak of having a sex scene with a murderer. Because that's sort of messed up. And they did end up having the sex scene, and I was like, okay, are we still going to make him the murderer, though? That would really spice it up a lot. But no, she didn't go there. And then it was really towards the end, maybe the last third, I can't exactly remember, where we did start getting more into the working out, what was that with all the ghost stuff? It was really sort of disconnected up until that point, but then we started getting a little bit more into it. And, you know, I did have some suspicions about certain characters as well as William. There were a couple of minor characters that were trying to sort of say it was them. And then she is able to talk to one of the ghosts who is William's sister, and she says that William did it. But it's not that far in the book. To, it's not so much the ending like it's not at that point of, it was too early to think this was the right answer is what I'm trying to say but yeah she was all like oh no in denial about it and she did consider it you know give her that she did consider that it could be William but she really didn't think it was anyway when she finally ends up talking to William which is after a lot of stuff I don't even care to get into um, yeah they basically go through four different theories back to back of who it could be so initially when she's seeing all the ghosts and seeing their remnants and seeing flashes of things she thinks the murderer is I can never remember his name one of the forebears of in her time. Harold? I'm getting the name Harold. Anyway, a grounds person. She thinks it's Harold. There's like three murder victims that we end up finding out about. And in her vision she's seen him burying one and carrying one of them out to the mall, so we think it's Harold. Then you know, as my suspicions are, she thinks it's William, because that's who William's sister Cordelia accuses. And then we think maybe it's August, which is William's friend, and then finally we get to Cordelia. But the way they sort of present it, it's sort of very bunched up. Like, through most of the story, when she's considering that there could have been a murder, she's thinking it's Harold. And then, you know, I sort of had suspicions about William, but she didn't really think about William until maybe about a two thirds of the way through. Yeah, probably let's say two thirds of the way through when Cordelia said about William. And then straight away she runs through two other scenarios. Which is uh, Harold and August or something. No, she talks about it with William. August and then it's Cordelia. But the way they do it is sort of just in conversation back and forth with each other as they pull out more and more details. So, yeah, it just felt very bunched up, like, oh, here's one theory plausible. No, it's not that one, it's here's another theory that's plausible. Actually, no, it's not that one, here's the final solution, which puts all the puzzle pieces in place. And not that it's bad to have 
and all the different characters that could be the killer. I think that's a good idea. But, you know, the way it would, you know, usually paced out, I believe, the mystery is you following lots of different trails, lots of different leads, and it's sort of red herring, and you go down, and you know, it wasn't as good a story, so it all just sort of tumbled out in a single chapter, all these different theories. And it was sort of like maybe the author didn't know until right at the end, like choosing who it was going to be. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why she chose to, to do it in that way, to pace it in that way, that put all of the possible solutions together back to back. Maybe that is normal. I haven't read that many mysteries. Maybe that is the normal way they do it, but I personally thought it could have been paced a bit better. Anyway, so she works out that it is Cordelia, which is William's sister, that ends up killing the little boy when they were children, and she was the one that killed his fiancée, Eliza, when he was in his 20s, and she was the one that killed his, her uncle when she was 15 because she was jealous about Bronwyn getting close to her brother, so she came into her time and scared her uncle out the window. Oh, that was the other murder, actually, so there's four murders. Little boy. Cordelia, her, oh, Cordelia herself, she was she was killed by Harold. Yeah, but he didn't know about that. Anyway, um, so they worked out all the things. They, by naming the ghosts and naming the crimes, the ghosts were able to move on. But then when they moved on, she was thrown back in her time, couldn't get back to William. She was a little devastated, and I was like, oh, that's a pretty sad ending to the story, but somehow the floorboard, oh, floorboard, I'll have to do a whole thing about the floorboard, but anyway, there's a floorboard in her room, which he can put notes into, she will find a hundred years later those notes. But for some reason, when she removes a note in her time, he can see that it's gone. Even though he would have had to leave it there, it would have had to stay there for hundreds of years for her to receive it. Somehow, in his time, he places a note there and then later sees the note has been taken. So, I don't know, it doesn't make all the sense in the... in the rules that she set out for how the time travel sort of works, but whatever. This time travel doesn't make any sense. <sighs> anyway, um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, so they she can't get back to his time, but that little floorboard trick is still working. So he's sending her notes. She can take them out, but she can't send anything back to the past. But they get some little system going where he puts a certain number of coins in, and she takes a certain number of coins out for yes or no, so they have a bit of a exchange, even though they can't really talk to each other properly. And it just seems like she's never going to get back into her time. And then she starts throwing up. And I was like, oh no, she's pregnant. And yes, she turns out to be pregnant with his child because she didn't think about protection when they were having sex in his time period. But for some reason, she's overjoyed about this. I would have thought it would be devastating, but she was really happy about it. Okay. And then, yeah, very, very last little pages. So she's about to drive off in her car to do something. And then the front door opens and she thinks she sees William and she stops the car and she's like, what, no, did he die? Is he a ghost now? I'm so sad. Then he comes into the car and he's real and he somehow got into her time. Even though he's never been able to do that before. She thinks maybe it has something to do with the fact that she just laid Harold's ghost to rest and released him. We don't really know. And it's like, okay, I'm glad they got a happy ending didn't make all the sense how that worked I don't know, I don't really know how to feel about the time travel stuff not making sense because it's not like it's a sci-fi novel where they try to justify everything through particular world building and technology it's sort of just supposed to be like this is sort of what's happening and they don't really know why it's happening or how it's happening or the exceptions to the rule they're just going along with it, so it's like, okay, I guess I'll go along with it. I don't know. Um, so, yes. Okay, so, the 
the good parts, the strongest parts were probably they did have some good banter sometimes. Some of their little jokes were funny. You know, some was just like, okay, you're beating a dead horse now. Let's move on. Like at the same time, you know, I, I sometimes enjoyed it. Like sometimes they talked about her, the way she dressed, and you know how ankles were scandalous but breasts were not, and how that's sort of a funny thing. And he's like, oh, we should live in your time frame. A woman just walked down the streets like that. Haha. <laughs> I'm looking respectfully. Um, and that was kind of funny, you know, they had a bit of a banter, and she was sort of teasing him, and she was saying about, oh, you've got to take me for a ride, and then he was like, mm mm-hmm. and then she was like, I'm in a horse ride, okay, I'm going to distract you now with dancing like you wanted me to do originally, and I was like, okay, you know, it was kind of like cringe, but it was kind of cute, it was kind of cute, and, um, yeah, when they did start being sexual, it was like, well written, I enjoyed that, but it was disappointing because she didn't go into it. Maybe that's just the convention of this particular genre. Maybe. I don't know. I feel like paranormal romance is a thing, though. And romance surely has sex scenes in it. Or does erotica... Is erotica the only adult genre that has sex in it? I don't know. Maybe fan fiction has put the wrong ideas in my head, but I don't understand why they're not going into more detail with the sex scenes. I'm just going to say that. Okay. Um... Yeah, so they did have some good bands. They had some good bands. Okay, chemistry. The things that annoyed me was just like the over going into detail about things that didn't matter, explaining different social differences between them that didn't really matter. It was just info dumping, info dumping, or the character some reason like showing the audience. I don't know why. Pacing could have been better. World building could have been better way they the mystery unfolded could have been better um overall it didn't super engage me to want to keep reading but when i pushed myself to get through it today i did get some enjoyable moments um overall i think the premise could have had some more interesting things happen and probably didn't reach its full potential but it wasn't terrible it was still a somewhat sensical and enjoyable journey I think so overall I'm going to rate this three stars the first book that I can actually rate three stars so that's a real motivation for me wanting to finish it today as I wanted to give a, a rating for a three star book um, luckily most of the books I've read so thus far have been pretty good like fours some four and a half or fives and I think the very first book I reviewed was three and a half stars. So this is definitely a three. It's like an average book. To me this is an average book. It doesn't have glaring things that make me hate it. It has some merit. You know, it picked up at some point. But the overall experience was mediocre. So that's why I'm giving it three stars. And that's all I have to say about that. So I'll be back shortly with another review.